So we're here to celebrate uh, Material Girls. And I know that you should not judge a book by its cover, but it is a great cover. Um, I love it. And um, Kathleen, I'll just introduce this in case you, you know, know. Kathleen is, is a professor of philosophy at Sussex. She's published on a huge variety of subjects. Um, she's got an OBE but we won't go there. Um, my name's Suzanne Moore. I'm a journalist, columnist. I was at The Guardian and I'm not now. Um, I'm now at The Daily Telegraph or you can read me on um, Substack and I should do a little promo for myself at the end maybe. Um, I've set some weird alarm to go off, but so let's hope that doesn't happen as well. Um, one of the first things I wanted to ask you, Kathleen, is because the book is called Material Girls, and but the subtitle is why reality matters for feminism mm. and that's sort of quite mind-blowing to me the idea that reality somehow doesn't matter or couldn't matter but that just shows i think um why the kind of conflict that we're in around some of these debates around gender is so difficult that even to reference reality is somehow controversial um so I wanted to really ask you why you, is that why you wrote the book or why did you write this book now? Well, I wrote the book because I, um, I thought there was an opportunity for me to intervene effectively. Um, I know that might sound a bit cocky, but I was yeah. infuriated by the state of um, academic feminism, to be honest. Uh, on sex and gender specifically like I think some academic feminists do some really good work especially in the social sciences but on sex and gender I just thought what on earth is going on and there was a public consultation so we've been invited to give our views so you'd think that there would be a range of views given but there wasn't it was kind of a mm. monoculture um and so I just couldn't stop myself from initially intervening via blogs and stuff and then gradually being asked to do various bits and pieces for magazines and then um, it being suggested to write a book. But I, I felt like I had the capacity to analyze some of these pseudo intellectual arguments, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and see, and present them clearly for what they were. And, you know, the reference to reality is really just because academic feminism has just spiraled out into the galaxy um lately unconstrained by any empirical input mm -hmm. and i just think it needs to come back down to earth so some people will say that even to talk about some of the orthodox the orthodoxies of feminism or indeed the orthodoxies of quite a lot of mainstream discourse i.e trans women are women trans men are men and so on is in itself uh, transphobic uh, obviously I don't think that um, trying to talk about facts is transphobic and I don't think you do uh, and that that comes through strongly in the book that you know we are we are dealing here with some facts but when when was it that you realized actually that you were a kind of heretic um I I realised that I was at odds with the orthodoxy or the emerging orthodoxy um, when I saw Stonewall's slogan, trans women or women get over it. And I thought, hang on, <laughs> you know, that's a very aggressive and literal assertion, which I don't think is literally true. And being told to get over it suggests that we're supposed to take it as literal and not complain about it or examine it mm -hmm. just accept it so I thought that was a very weird move and it made me dis it gave me discomfort and then um as I started to read stuff and watch stuff I became aware that um a very one-sided story was being put forward and I did not agree with it yeah I didn't agree with it. I never did agree with it there was no real moment where I suddenly thought oh I don't I don't believe this, this story. Mm. I never did believe it. And I don't think a lot of people believe it either. Even mm -hmm. people who say it, who mouth the mantras, I, that's part of the book really. I think they're immersed in a fiction 
yeah which is understandable and maybe therapeutically beneficial for some people but it's also got its costs so I think we need to examine that one yeah um one of the things that you do in the book that I really think is so helpful I mean I think this book is going to be a kind of set text um even for people who are who who completely disagree with you because it's sort of set out so clearly and I actually want to sort of make you uh, talk you through (laughs) what you've written if you like because sometimes in the sort of generalized sort of uh, polarized debate and everybody insulting each other on Twitter you do kind of wake up sometimes and think how did we get here like Mm -hmm. what were the steps that led to this kind of madness really and I think that the way that you lay out the history is really really important so I'm gonna like step by step go through that with you if that's okay because I think it's really to me it was really helpful to see to see it laid out that way so I hope it's helpful to others so you start I guess as everybody does with the Beauvoir and that women are born not made and then you tell us that actually the, the distinction in the early 70s between sex and gender, which is, this is the crucial kind of point really here, was made by Anne Oakley. Now... Well, she was one of the people that... She was her. one of those people. people I mentioned, yeah. She, so, 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 so we're in the early 70s and people are making the distinction between sex, starting to make uh, sex and gender. That's, that's how feminists talk about these things. But... Quite a lot of feminists um, also rejected and um, wanted to reject the biological determinism that came with that, didn't they? Well, that's the thing with it, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I think the original distinction between sex and gender, or at least there is a very coherent distinction. The word gender, as I point out, gets used in all these different contexts. It means different things. So I really try hard to distinguish those different things. But one meaning of gender is the kind of social, cultural meanings around sex. Yeah. And that's fine. We need a word for those things. And they're obviously very different ones from culture to culture. Um, But um, more than that, um, uh, it came to be distinguished thought by some people like Butler, for instance, um, before she wrote Gender Trouble, that if you distinguish between sex and gender, you could somehow see off this threat of what was called biological determinism, mm-hmm. which is the worry or the, the idea that women and men, presumably, but mostly focused on women, are kind of biologically programmed to be domestic and not very bright and you know, good at homemaking and stuff like that. Now, that's a um, that's a view that I would dispute. I don't think it's true. Um, but the, the, the thinking seemed to be that it, it would be a really clever move to define womanhood in a way that wasn't biological. And then you'd avoid this threat of biological determinism. Uh-huh. Um, and as I say in the book, that's a bit like trying to get out of the earth being hit by an asteroid by redefining the earth as something that cannot be hit by an asteroid. <laughs> you know? yeah. It will make absolutely no difference to the empirical facts or yeah. wh- whatever they are about how our biologies interact with our psychologies. Um, so I just think that was a daft move. It wasn't done in the name of trans inclusivity. It was done in the name of trying to combat sexism. I don't mm-hmm. think it worked. It certainly didn't work, did it? I mean, we still had people banging on about biological determinism, undeterred by this amazing linguistic manoeuvre. But what it has done then is opened up this space for people to say, oh, womanhood is something social. It's not not just the name, a handy concept for an adult human female, it's something else. And that's then opened up a whole new space for people to um, insert themselves into. To to actually get rid of the biological bit yeah, to yeah. Say womanhood is like a social role or a set of behaviors or something or a, or a way of being perceived mm-hmm. um, and then you move on don't you in the book to um money john money and stoller who are doctors i think uh, talking about um medical conditions and often treating people who with um i guess we would now call intersex um 
and they were concerned. I guess they make the distinction between a, a gender, a, a private feeling of gender, and a, and a public role. Um, and then you move on from there to Anne Fausto Sterling, who I guess has influenced a lot of contemporary thought because she has the model of sex as a continuum. She has lots of different models, to be honest. <laughs> I found it. Okay, can you uh, talk she me through? That, well, she does say sex is a continuum, but she also yeah. says there are um, more than two sexes. Um, actually, I can't remember now. Is it five or six? Five. Five. Yeah. I've got written. I've got written down. I've got written down five. So five it is. <laughs> so <it'll be> five. <laughs> and she also at one point says that sex is just a matter of layers <laughs> or something. Yeah. But um, I do look at all of those different claims. I mean, yeah. So go on. What's I should wait for the question. <laughs> what's the question? No, no. I, I, so I'm, I'm, so so she starts talking about we can define sex as a continuum because she's starting to look at chromosomes. Is, is that right? Well, she she thinks that, um, well, she makes a big deal out of a lot of chromosomal variation and bodily variation, which there undoubtedly is. Mm -hmm. but, but, but it's one thing to note the variation and it's another to come up with a theory that says there's five sexes. Mm -hmm. What you need to do then is look and see, well, does any other theory explain this data equally well or better? <laughs> and I think... That's obviously true that there's a much better theory, which is that there are two sexes with some variation biologically, which is what you'd expect in biology because there's mutation and genetic mm -hmm. drift and things like that. So um, she it's not that I disagree with her drawing attention to the, the sort of wide, relatively wide variety of ways in which bodies can present um, in relation to chromosomes, it's just the conclusions, the theoretical, high theoretical conclusions that she draws, which she now sometimes says she was only ever drawing in a tongue-in-cheek way anyway. Okay. And that's a bit annoying because they've been made, they've been, you know, um, pushed into or, or used. Um, in fact, they're used by Butler. Butler in Gender Trouble cites Fausto Sterling as, as, some, as someone who shows that sex in some way is constructed. So shall we move on to to, to um, Butler? Um, <laughs> I know you want to. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Apparently, I'm ignorant about her, although I, I've taught her. But never mind. Um, I taught. I mean, I've taught her theory. But so Butler is, I guess, you know, seen as a founding. Uh, I wouldn't say mother because mother is obviously not a word that we can use these days. The founding uh, parent of um, gender as performance, and therefore a lot of queer theory. Um, and, you know, I still think that there's sort of, I'm a, I'm a bit of a pick and mix sort of girl, you know. I think there are things you can take from Butler and I, and I certainly think there are things you can take from Foucault. But what Butler does is say that everything is constructed in language and uh, there are no prior categories except these linguistic ones, uh, which then makes it possible to move completely away from yeah. any notion of embodied sexual yeah. identity. I mean, I think I actually do pick, take some cherry picks and bits of Butler for when I write about gender identity. I think actually some of the things she says about gender identity are sensible. But um, what I object to in Butler is that she has this all-encompassing metaphysical position, which is that, you know, language is, is really our only way of accessing what, what is, and there's nothing we can really think about, but she would say pre-discursively, before discourse, like before language. Mm. So everything's really radically um, arbitrary, really. Um, now, that's, that's a familiar enough position. She didn't invent that position. Um, there's lots and lots of philosophers that have thought some version of that. I don't think it's true, but, you know, fair enough. But then she she specifically picks on sex as the one thing that she just will not have you allowed to talk about, as it were, as a real thing. Yeah. Whereas, of yeah. course, if she's right, her conclusion ramifies out to everything. So why be so worried about sex? You know, so as I say, again, in the book, the best, uh, from my perspective, the most coherent social constructivists allow it that there is a sense in which these things really do exist independently of us even you know you've mm. got to be sense of that idea there's got to be a difference between stuff I just made up and stuff that's true um 
but she doesn't seem to have that kind of finesse to me. And in her later books, because I read a lot of her books and I actually reviewed her last one um, for the Times Literary Supplement, she allows all sorts of things like environmental catastrophe and, you know, things that you think, well, hang on a minute, I thought this was all constructed. Mm. <laughs> so mm. why, are we, why are we allowed to think about this stuff and talk about this stuff as if it really exists, but yeah. not stuff? And I don't know what the answer is there, but I don't think it makes sense. Yeah, because, I mean, it, I guess she comes out of that kind of post-Derrida thing. There's nothing outside the text, but even Derrida said in the end there is a sort of real that you can interpret. I mean, it's this idea, isn't it, that if we don't uh, name a thing, it doesn't exist. I mean, but gravity presumably existed before somebody called it oh, so gravity. But what, what, what really, I guess, what really bugs me about the use of um, certain kind of post-structuralists, post-modernists like uh, Butler, and, and I've been really into it, I was really into it, I guess, in the 90s, is that is the context that they're coming out of and they're post-Marx, you know, they're reacting to a failed kind of Marxism. And um, if we have to go anywhere, you know, let's go back to Marx, who at least understood material bodies and reproductive labour and, and these things that are, you know, if you like, real. Um, and then the next, the next bit that you talk about, who I don't know too much about, is, the, is, is uh, Julia Serrano. And she moves then from a, completely away from bio, biological sex and says that it, it's just your, is it just your identification that makes you a man or a woman? Well... I mean, I think that's a constant thing she says. Um, I mean, she was writing in the early 2000s. So I, I focused on her because I think she's been quite influential, that book. So she's a trans woman um, and she's a biologist. So weirdly, I think she got some kind of cachet, you know, that she knows what she's talking about. But some of the things she says, I think, don't really stack up um, in simple scientific terms. But um, she, she was influential because, A, she was um, widely read and she wrote this book called Whipping Girl, but also because um, she introduced the idea of cis, or at least she, it, she brought it into popular consciousness, I think, cisgender. And so the idea is there's two kinds of women. There's the trans women and there's the cis, cisgender woman. And mm -hmm. she also argues that trans is an adjective. Okay. So, you know, there's Asian women, I think she says, but, you know, she goes through kinds of women and then there's, and there's trans women, it's just another kind of woman. And so that's the shift into um, thinking of trans, being a transsexual woman as being a literal woman. And she also describes herself as a lesbian. Okay. So I think okay. she's just quite, you know, quite a good example of those, both of those things. But does she, or is this the point, I don't know what, what date we're at now, but is this the point where um, there's a kind of separation between gender identity and your sexual orientation? Well, I, I think, yes. I mean, around that time, people started to talk about um, sexual identities, like I identify as gay, I identify as a lesbian. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know, you know, well, obviously culture moves messily and I don't, you know, I'm not a historian. That's the other thing I do keep having to say. I'm not an historian. So I really do hope that we'll have in the coming years some much richer investigations as to how we got where we go, what, where we yeah, are. Yeah. So Joyce's book is coming out in a few months' time. Yeah. Look at that. But um, so I was really just taking sort of emblematic moments, as it were. And I just think around the 2000s, um, we did start to see this move towards gender identity emerging, which wasn't a really an important concept for early transsexuals, as far as I can see. Mm. Um, it, it, the important thing was to be trans, uh, meaning to have some kind of bodily modification or at least change your dress. It wasn't about how you felt inside and whether you felt like a girl or felt like a boy. Yeah, I'm, I think it's really like interesting, the difference between... Uh, orientation and, and identity because I'm so often told and I'm sure you are too that this all of these arguments that people are having are simply reruns of arguments that have always 
already been had. For instance, Section 28, which, you know, I was there, I'm sure you were there. And that was an argument about making positive representation <laughs> of uh, gay people, to me. Mm-hmm. It was not an argument about gender ID. No, it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. I don't know what the... And the analogy is just supposed to be, like, right side of history. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just crude, a crude analogy that doesn't make any sense. And it becomes... I mean, I don't want to start ranting, and I've obviously had a gin now. I do have a rant. <laughs> I think we're all ready, ready for a rant here, so... It becomes particularly offensive when you realise that, along with this ideology, goes the idea that trans women are lesbians. Like, say... Trans women, males, attracted to females, I would call them heterosexual males, are lesbians, you know, and that's supposed to be the analogy with Section 28. I mean, it's directly against the interests of same-sex attracted people, this ideology, and it's also hurting young same-sex attracted people who are misunderstanding their own circumstances mm. and possibly mm. modifying their bodies in permanent ways. So to, it's just a, yet another example of the sort of gaslighting annoying <laughs> tactics of trans activists and I may always make the point that trans activists are not trans people I do not believe trans activists are, are speaking for trans people as a whole so I just want to make that clear in case anyone thinks that I'm criticizing oh them. and I yeah and I completely want to um, echo that and I would say a lot of most of the kind of threats and nasty stuff I've had has never come from trans people but these so-called allies who are often um guys I'm sorry I just see it as an incredibly um another way to be misogynistic a lot of the time so when so talking of that when so when when does um the term turf arrive in about 2008 I think you said but for me it was later I didn't I'd never heard of it when when does um well I can't exactly remember the date that I said <laughs> 2008. I really should have done this one. But it was based, and my understanding. You your own book, Kathleen. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a, uh, my understanding is that it was somebody writing a, their blog and they inadvertently transgressed by advertising this Mitch Fest, which is a, a was a festival for women in the original sense with a strong lesbian contingent and there'd been a lot of argy-bargy about whether Mitch Fest was trans exclusive. And this woman inadvertently advertised Mitch Fest and was called to task for it and then put up this groveling apology in which she coined the term turf. Right. And said, I, basically, I'm not a nasty turf. And it just seems to have taken off as a kind of really handy, uh, acronym that you can combine with all sorts of uh, insults that sound great together, like fucking turf or sorry, sorry, mum. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, I won't go on. You can, but you know, I'm it, here. It, 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 <laughs> I don't know if she's got back in. To be honest, I think we locked out. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a, it's become a slur. I think. I mean, it, it's, oh, definitely, yeah. It's true that like people like me sometimes recuperate it ironically because what else can you do when people are telling you to shut the fuck up turf etc so when so when this so 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 we get to you know coming up to now and we've got this absolute explosion of these new gender identities i mean some i uh, that you name i'd never heard of like de- demi de- demi demi fluid and demi fluid is that like part-time kind of but i think that could be me it's, the demi yeah. oh well i think we're all demi flux aren't we demi flux yeah i like it i think i could go with it it's like sort of you, you don't commit fully really do you well apparently what it is is so if you go to the university of kent uh trans policy which is the you know laying out how trans people at Kent must be addressed it's got all this list of possible identities that are protected at Kent and one of them is demi flux and one of them is demi fluid they're both worded identically mm. and then it says but you but do not confuse these two because one of the identities in demi fluid being demi fluid is non binary or something so you know it becomes as i say once you detach these identities from sex and binary sex even like I do I completely understand what it is to identify as the opposite sex 
and I understand what it is to identify as androgynous, but I have absolutely no idea what it is to identify as demiflux or pangender, which is another one where you identify with an infinite number of genders, mm. including some possibly that haven't been discovered yet. It's and that's quite powerful, isn't it, to think <laughs> it could be that, though? I can see that's quite like, you know, you must feel quite sort of... I feel like you've got a lot in <laughs> Yeah. When you walk into the pub and you know that you are, you know, could be anybody. Um, I, I don't know if it works like that. Um, but more seriously, I guess a lot of people have got involved in this debate and a lot of feminists who haven't perhaps paid that much attention to this um to all of this and have been really absolutely sympathetic towards trans people being um, having a, having a hard time. I mean, that's, I would say that's most people I know, right? We, we have no desire to uh, stop the legal protections for trans people or for them to be discriminated against or to suffer hate crime or violence. And, I, and that's made absolutely clear in your book, but we are very concerned. Uh, I think a lot of women are very concerned about what's happening to, teenagers and children um and you know just the stats from um the kids uh, gender identity dysphoria service in the last 10 years where which have uh, have just risen massively from young women young teenage teenage girls basically wanting or possibly wanting to transition or turning up in a in a huge distress and it's gone up the figure by 5337% um so it's turned around in the, in the in the public consciousness i would have said before now nearly all the discussion was male to female transitioning that's that's sort of what, but now what we're seeing is something else isn't it yeah i mean i think we're seeing very possibly seeing lots of different things that are all being shoved together by trans activist organizations like stonewall and treated as if they're absolutely the same so there's obviously a difference between a late transitioning male you know age 45 with a wife and kids and a teenage girl in distress you know, with a history of anorexia and self-harm, mm -hmm. who hates her body and feels her strong gender dysphoria. Like, so those are different things for a start. And there's lots of other different things in there that I think we need to know more about too. So that's one of my complaints about the very simplistic, childishly simplistic way that this is presented by activists as good versus bad and, you know, um, you're either with us or against us, or it's this or it's that. You know, there's there's lots of complexity here that we need to to understand. But yeah, girls are basically. It's my understanding that you know teenage girls who who um, since the rise of smartphones, their their whole lives have been transformed. They are now you know constantly in contact with objectification by others or self objectification, constantly mm -hmm. taking selfies, mm -hmm. being judged by their peers. There's um, stats that show that self harm's going up um, generally in that age in in teenage girls, um, and I I would like us all as a collective society to start putting the pieces of the puzzle together and seeing that girls will take whatever tools from the culture they are offered to express their distress, and at the moment they're being offered this narrative that mm -hmm. you're possibly in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. there's a, you know, there's a predominance of same-sex attracted girls in that cohort, and there's also autistic girls and girls with histories of trauma, and we need to protect them. Um, and I don't think we're doing that at the moment. No, that, I mean, obviously there's a Kira Bell case, but there's also, I mean, I get a lot of um, emails from therapists and medical staff um, concerned about what they're being asked to do after maybe only... I mean, the shock in the Kira Bell case was that she was put on that medical pathway after three sessions of therapy. I mean, it's just bad therapeutic practice. Um, this is not to do with whether people, I mean, for some people it is the right thing to transition and to, 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 to go on that path, but it clearly isn't. It should not be handed out in uh, as a kind of way of just dealing with, as you say, the deep distress. And there's no data of this kind of distress compared to the distress of people uh young people who present to cams uh children's and adolescent mental health services um you are presented I, i've done a bit of therapy training you are presented always with people 
in a, a point of distress. And at some point, if you, you will ask them, do you ever feel like not being here anymore? And if they say yes, which they usually do, because people have those feelings, then that's suicidal ideation. But we have no way of comparing in that age group mm -hmm. what's going on at in the gender clinics to what's just going on right across the board. I mean, I, I just would like a lot more money, obviously, poured into adolescent mental health for full stop. Um, that's just, sorry, that's just me 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 going on about it's, that. It's very salient. That's part of the conversation. I mean, um, if you can't get an appointment in CAMS for, for, you know, a year or more, and, and I don't know, I mean, I believe the waiting lists are, the gender identity service are also long but I'm hearing of people not just teenagers actually people who have just reached the age of majority so it's mm -hmm. not I mean we're treating it as if there's this really sharp cut off and as soon as you're 18 you know what you're doing but I don't think that's true no you reach 18 go and have an appointment hormones or cross-sex hormones that week you know I mean it's very weird and I think anomalous for talking therapy and the psychological profession generally and the psychiatric profession to treat um, a psychological state of mind so quickly with a drug, you know, mm. so quickly. And, and not just sertraline, you know, a drug that leaves irrevocable effects on your body. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, I have high hopes that the medical profession will get their asses in gear and sort this out. Well, it, but it's really, really shocking, isn't it? When you read the DSM five, the 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 criteria which is used to diagnose gender dysphoria, um, which is a pathology in a way, and it, but it, it's so little. I mean, it's just like a child playing with the toys of the opposite sex. I mean, it doesn't, you know. I mean, I you read that and you think there's no way that I would make that diagnosis from those few things and it's also really kind of quite paranoid i think about homosexuality yeah. and that and that is why i people like me are really kind of pissed off with the idea that any of this stuff is actually radical because it it appears you know absolutely anti homosexual anti you know left anti-materialist and yet we are told this is uh this is somehow a kind of progression of thinking when it, it it in fact is a kind of reinstatement of gender roles that we really have for a long time kind of rejected and it's also a very handy way of making money because once you frat you know you diversify the number of identities there are then you multiply your customers exponentially so you know and you can sell you can sell this. I mean, I think that um, I talk to people in the States and they tell me that um, there are surgeons advertising mastectomies to uh, teenagers on TikTok. Yeah, 13 year olds. Yeah, someone sent me something. Yeah. 13. Um, um, you need to wake up about what's going on there. Over there. Well, it clearly, but it clearly is, you know, um, a, a big business. Could, you know, that's. That's kind of interesting, I think, right now to talk about the differences between what's happening here and in the States, because clearly, uh, you know, we're always told that everybody everywhere else is completely happy and down with this stuff. Um, but clearly they're not in Scotland. They're not in Ireland. Uh, some people in America are. Uh, and it's perceived as, a, as always a right a right wing move. But um, this is in the States now, this is, I mean, this, as you say, it's huge business, isn't it, for both the pharmaceutical companies and the surgeons who are prepared to do this stuff. And we're now seeing lots of cases of them being countersued because things have, people are not happy afterwards. I mean, I don't want to focus, like you, I don't want to focus totally on the detransitioners because I think it kind of can, you know, can uh, take us, you know, away from the the fact that yes it might it might be oh shit sorry um might be right for some people um but yeah. that was when we, that that alarm was meant to go off when we started at the right time but we didn't <laughs> well, can <laughs> we I didn't. just say I mean I do want to to just draw attention to the fact that so much of the toxicity of this conversation comes from people in America not understanding what's going on in the UK I mean we yeah. have gender reassignment protected in law which I've never 
not said anything negative about, I think, um, nor have I. Should be. And there's absolutely no way that trans people should ever be discriminated against in employment or in healthcare or, you know, face um, violence or harassment. You know, none of that is acceptable. Um, so the argument is about changing the law. Americans just don't seem to be able to get this, but it's about changing the law to protect an inner feeling instead of a behavioral process or at least some kind of process that you can observe. Um, and I just think we also have the NHS, you know, so um, that makes sense to the context. And again, nobody's, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I love the NHS. So uh, the, all of that, those cross purposes just mean um, people are getting a bizarrely distorted idea of what it is that the argument is about. And even to the point where I'm now seeing British trans activists just sort of rehearsing American talking points as if they apply to our situation, which they clearly don't. So I saw yeah. a trans woman on YouTube the other day saying that she had no healthcare rights, you know, in Britain. I mean, that's just bollocks. <laughs> she does. So um, it just doesn't help people conflating these two situations, which are obviously very different. Well, I think that really came out with the Trans Remembrance Day, because while that's a really important thing to think about the people who are murdered and particularly in Brazil, because there's a lot of uh, trans people doing sex work to pay for their own um, transitioning and the states. Um, in the last couple of years, no trans people have been murdered here. I'm not, you know, like we don't like murder. Let's make that clear. We don't like murder. But um it was a sort of borrowing from another culture. And we had Dawn Butler standing up and saying there's no such thing as sex and sex is assigned at birth. I don't know how anyone who's ever had a child thinks it operates, but, um, you know, I just imagine like these midwives dancing around a room and kind of drawing straws. Well, it kind of isn't like that. And it kind of also, um, you know, sex is if you like, identified in a fetus at 12 weeks. And I know that because I have gone to countries where that the, the, um, the girl child is aborted. I've done stories on sex selection. So the idea that it's assigned it, but these, you know, there is a generation of girls who never get born, you know. So I think um, we, we really, we, people should actually be really geographically specific when they're talking and I think another as a feminist as well I mean and you you kind of say it towards the end of the book if we have a politics at all I mean we are concerned about FGM we are concerned about menstrual hearts we are concerned about the so-called honor killings I hate we obviously we hate that word honor um and how do we tackle that with this when this discourse predominates well, that's the thing that, will, I mean, many things get me going about this, but one of them is the pretense of, you know, largely middle-class academic feminists in universities or in the third sector, um, all graduates, the pretense that they're somehow going to be able to square that circle, still be able to do all the things feminists were supposed to, feminism was supposed to do, but still have, but also have changed the subject completely onto a different group of people because now they no longer include trans men as women uh -huh. and they include trans women as women. And that's basically shifted the category because there's, we're no longer uh -huh. talking about um, sex or the social impacts of sex. Even we're talking about some supposed feeling, which in fact, half the women don't have anyway, because they don't have a gender identity. So they don't know what that means. And so they've really just in this completely decadent way, changed the subject of feminism and hoped that it would all be all right. And when it wasn't all right, they've told us all off and told <laughs> us we've got it wrong. And yeah. if we could just give up our minds and outsource our consciences and brains to them, they would, you know, the forces society would sort it all out, whatever. It's absolutely nonsense. And I'm so glad that the grassroots are not having any of it. <laughs> no, they're not because, I mean, it's... When I talk to some people, um, I think feminism is, they talk about feminism as though it was a sort of charity and you just should just be nice to everybody. <laughs> um, whereas my understanding of feminism is, is pretty um, blood and guts and power based. I mean, I want women to have more power. I don't want to just be, you know, go around being kind yeah. to sort of anybody who thinks I should be kind to them. Um, 
you know, I, try, I do actually try to be always, you know, kind to individual people. I do respect, I will use people's pronouns, for instance, that doesn't, you know, all of that. I think, I think you're much the same, Kathleen. But mm-hmm. I, wondered, I wanted to ask you really, if you, if you might not want to talk about it, but like how it's kind of affected you personally in your day-to-day work. Hmm. Um, well, lockdown's been good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That says, that says something, I think. I mean, look, my relationships with my students are good and on the whole. I mean, I know that's hostage to fortune. There'll be some disgruntled person popping up any time now. But, you know, on average, I think I have a reasonable professional relationships with students and I really enjoy teaching. Um what I have not enjoyed is um, colleagues, either at my institution or in my uh, subject area, which is philosophy, and we all know each other, or you know, there's conferences we're all supposed to go to. I have not enjoyed them lying about me, uh, telling the world that I'm a danger to my students, mm. that I want them to not exist, you know, giving me absolutely horrific uncharitable interpretations of things I've said um that has absolutely you know affected my working life because I'm trying to get get on with students and you know I have I teach trans students Mm. reason you know it and have normal professional relationships with them so it's been horrible and um and I'm not alone in that I mean anyone knows I'm sure you do too, like what it's like to be at a toxic workplace where there's a significant number of people who really despise you and not only despise you, but really are going to go out of their way to whip up a feeling of animosity towards you. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's terrible. I mean, mean, so it's personally terrible, but it's also obviously terrible for knowledge production because I'm at university so I'm supposed to be talking about this stuff and and my other people watch what's said about me in department meetings or online and it puts them off getting involved Mm -hmm. or even for sticking up for me they just don't want to do it because then they will then the sort of you know the machine gun will come around and it will be focused at them so it Mm -hmm. chills everybody else it ostracizes me and this I'm just you know I'm relating this as an instructive example because it's going on in campuses all over Mm, UK yeah. and in you know progressive workplaces and third sector organizations um the tactics of the opposition are just mean-spirited uncharitable and uh toxic yeah because I find that I get a lot of you know obviously when I wrote and said the things I did um I was able still to carry on working and get another job and but that's because I have something of a name, but every day I get uh, emails from people, nearly always in the public sector, teachers, uh, social workers, doctors, who feel that they cannot, it's not they even want to challenge this ideology. They, they feel they cannot even ask a question in a meeting or they will be reported or they will not be promoted. Or So, I mean, in, in, a, in, a, in a way, I mean, these tactics work because it, yeah. I mean if I could wake up tomorrow and never have to deal with this shit again yeah me too <laughs> I mean you know what I mean you're like you, you oh, no, definitely, because and that's the problem I mean it's turned a generation of people of a certain disposition into basically like the rolled doll villain in a children's story or the class mm. Mm. I, mean, I don't know yes it works but how would you live with yourself after knowing that you've just you know basically become this caricature of a children's villain children's book villain <laughs> that's why I see it I and mean, when people are like you know reporting me to my, my employer I, you know you would have been really good in the Stasi yeah but I guess you know you've got this um compulsion to as a philosopher and as a probably as a, I don't really know you but I, I, I imagine as a person to to some sort of truth. Um, I think that's where that's got, I think that's your problem really. <laughs> it's caused you a lot, of, a lot of problems. Um, I think I've got it a bit, but because you, you know, you keep on asking in the book, these really very simple, but also very complicated questions. Like what is, what is a woman mm-hmm. and what do concepts do? And why do we have the concept of a woman? And 
how do we, you know, is that a, is that a useful tool, tool and what do concepts do? Because that's your discipline. Could you talk about that for a bit? Because I think it's really interesting to me the way you do. Well, I mean, that's partly the method of analytic philosophy, which is to, um, you know, really there's no question methodologically you can't ask. Um, and you should be able to justify your method. Now, I think what is actually really interesting about this um, whole area and sort of the challenge posed to us by trans activists who are saying, you know, trans women are women, there's no such thing as sex, we don't need to talk about sex, we can just, you know, vacate our language from sex, uh, from any term associated with sex. That, that, that forces me to go back and say, well, hang on a minute, why do we need, you know, A, what is sex? Why do we need to talk about sex? Why does it matter? What are concepts anyway? You know, go right, right back. Yeah. Because yeah. um, some of the arguments are like metaphysical and about philosophy of language. Um, and actually it's really hard to do because you take these concepts for granted, obviously, absolutely for granted, and you're not often challenged that um, at, a, at that basic a level in philosophy, it's normally understood like there's this common ground we share and then we can tinker around the edges, argue about those, but it's very rare that you get somebody to say, no, hang on a minute, we're gonna go right into the center of the web of meaning and go, why have we got that bit? So um, yeah, it was actually hard to do in a sense. It involved a lot of sort of thinking it through for myself, but that's good because now I know. <laughs> so. So, so you, in the end, come back to this idea I guess that because you work you work it out you work out the differences between sex and gender that the actual when when it comes to to legal to, uh, practice the uh, the idea that you can change sex is a fi is 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 a fiction mm -hmm. yeah it's a fiction and I think so I think that that fits with when you look at what sex is, it's not the sort of thing you can change through drugs or surgery. Or, um, and I also think when you actually look at Hansard, as I do, you can see um, in the discussion that they're really, A, they're quite, un a lot of the, the, the people talking about it are quite unclear. So this is the original discussion of the Gender Recognition Act. They were quite unclear what they're talking about. Like there's just a lot yeah. of about acquired gender and how that relates to sex. But I think the, best way of understanding the Gender Recognition Act is that it puts in place a legal fiction that people can change sex so they should be treated as if they are of the opposite sex but it's as if not you know yeah, yeah. they are it's not saying they are and that's obvious because in the wording of the Gender Recognition Act it's although it says something like you know once you've got a legally acquired gender you should be treated for all purposes as if you were the opposite sex it immediately specifies there's about five contexts when where that doesn't work. So, you yeah, know, yeah, already got um, various exemptions and built into it. So I just think it makes most sense. I mean, my original field in philosophy is yeah. fiction, and I have always thought that this is a therapeutically useful fiction that we are being asked to get in, get immersed in. Um, but it's not fact. That's, that's to me, that makes the best sense of it. And it also really makes sense of the way that the toxicity has gone around this, because effectively, when you're immersed in a fiction, what you really don't want someone to do is point out reality, because it basically removes the immersion. It's a bit like, um, you know, an actor on stage saying, I'm an actor, <laughs> you know, you can't, yeah. you can't engage anymore. So, so there's a real attempt to suppress any acknowledgement of the fact that this is a fiction by any means necessary. And that seems to be what hap to me what's happening. And um, think, I think we've been talking for about 40 minutes, but I think we'll go, I'll ask you a couple more questions. Yes. And I think if people are happy with that and then, yeah, and then we can have another drink. Um, <laughs> so if it's, yeah, so, so by you saying it's a fiction, are you um, denying, you will be accused of denying, oh, shut up. Sorry, everybody. Are you denying? I mean, even us having this discussion will be, it will be said we have denied the existence of, of trans people or caused sort of literal violence. But what I really wanted, I guess what I'm kind of want to talk about uh, is 
the Stonewall and Mermaid's tactics of how we got to that, because I can see the new Stonewall tactics are now completely focused on children. Um, Sports to some extent as well, yeah. 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 I mean, so first of all, I'm just to be clear, I'm not denying that trans people exist because what I'm doing is arguing with a philosophical theory about identity and its significations, but yeah. I'm not saying they're not trans. I'm not saying trans people shouldn't be protected in law. I'm certainly not saying you shouldn't be able to be trans. I think you should. Yeah. If someone tried to stop that, I would argue against it. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm just arguing about whether it's inner feelings that should be protected in law or something else. And I'm arguing what, about what it means to say, I am a woman when you're male or when I'm a man when you're female. And I realize it is distressing probably for some people to hear that I think it's a fiction um, because perhaps they believe it themselves or they just don't want to be reminded of that. And I'm sorry about that. And I'm certainly not gonna go up to an individual trans person and say this. Mm -hmm. what, we've, what we've lost as a society through the past, you know, the emotional manipulation of Stonewall and mermaids mainly, is the ability to make the general statement. Like, yeah, yeah. Every time I say something like, you know, I'm afraid I don't think that trans women are literally women, that's equated with, you know, going up to a trans woman and screaming in their face, you're a man. That's not yeah. what I'm doing. I'm making a general statement, which I think is true, but I would obviously modulate for context and yeah. Of the normal politeness norms. So, yeah. What, so, what, <laughs> what I would... Why, how does this impact on, on, on women, you know, on, on... We've lost the capacity to talk about sex, like, um, freely. So you've just got to cross your fingers and hope now when you're talking about sex in an academic context, for instance, if you're talking about women, mm -hmm. research project on women, or you're doing data collection on women, and then, you know, you've just really got to cross your fingers that someone doesn't say, sorry, are you trans-inclusive? You know, mm -hmm. who... who do you mean, are you, you know, are you a turf or, or are you, do you mean trans women as well? And then you've got to change the whole direction of research or have an argument mm. and be, be exposed to lots of criticism. So it's really muting um, women and men's capacity to talk about things that matter. And sex does matter in sport, in medicine, in sexual assault statistics, in how we arrange society to protect women from uh, violence and so on. So, it's uh, having terrible effect on free speech. I think it's having a terrible effect on public understanding because some people are just hearing the fiction and thinking it's literally true. And then children are hearing that and constructing their own interpretations of themselves accordingly. Yeah, it's disaster. It's absolute disaster. What, what, what strikes me about some of this stuff is it, it, it's the kind of opposite of, of what's, what it claims to be because the notion of intersectionality gets completely lost in this track in this in this and um i i do wonder sometimes if i mean like i am just it's just a speculation but and it is the election thing <laughs> on the elections today but that this kind of um you know declaration trans trans rights you know that's where i'm going to put my energy and obviously on social media and it's it's it, that's where everybody is um and yet there are no class politics. There is no, nothing about class in this at all. And yet class is so obviously relevant, isn't it? I mean, like I yeah, said. Yeah, I think so. This is graduates. Um, and like you say, allies. Uh, most trans activists I know are not trans. So, you know, it's coming out of um, university educated middle class people, of which I am obviously one, but I can still recognise it when I see it. Um, you know, confecting outrage and confecting a, a narrative which makes them look very virtuous on behalf of a sort of idealised, projected other. You mm -hmm. know, and, it's, and it's very neat, isn't it? It's very, I don't know why, but it, it seems to like be so much easier to talk about trans rights than to talk about systematic um, racism or the plight of the working class. You know, there's a local... There's the county police station near where I live and they had um, a trans flag up. Uh, I think it was for Trans Day of Remembrance recently. But, you know, I haven't seen a BLM 
BLM flag up <laughs> at the front of the police station. It's sort of very easy, an easy win, I think, for mm -hmm. corporations. I saw the Royal Navy today have got a new, I think it's the Royal Navy got a new protocol for pronouns. You know, you can request to have your pronouns as Zia or him or whatever, something made up per, Z, Zim or something. Anyway, it's just decadent and banal, isn't it? It's just, it's just frivolous. <laughs> But, okay, so I think this is going to be the last question um, because people have been here so long waiting for us before, <laughs> before we start speaking. But um, they're probably all hammered. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, how, how do we build bridges here? Because actually, I think you do start to do uh, that, do that, and and I want to do that. I mean, for all that what I'm known for and what you're known for, I mean, I don't think this is an irresolvable conflict. I think we can we can move forward if 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 you know that's my hope, right? I hope so. I mean, I think it will require changing the terms. You know, gender identity as the priority is just not going to work. An inner feeling that is undetectable to the, you know, under any circumstances is not going to work. Um, so my cat's now just come in. To oh, yeah, I've shut mine out. Yeah, go. But, um, but I do think that clearly a lot of the young, young people who are non-binary or who are, are expressing, um, who have uh, gender identity issues have a lot in common with... Um, all of us, because we've all been there, and particularly women, particularly um, same-sex attracted women or gender non-conforming women. So I would like to see dialogue between those two groups in particular, because I think we've got shared experiences. And in a way, what we're doing is that, you know, they're saying they're non-binary. Um, on our side, we're saying that gender can be oppressive, but it's really, in some sense, the same impulse, just mm. differently. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... So yeah. you're really, I mean, you're kind of asking for a much more non-binary view of gender. Yeah, I am. Well, you? Yeah. And the same with the, the discussion about spaces. It's really, if only Stonewall had put its firepower behind saying there should be third spaces, all mm. kind, kinds of space, different kinds of sports team, you know, instead of just saying, no, no, trans women must go in the women's, and women must accommodate them. That's that's a very binary uh, yeah. kind of setup. We need to be more flexible, more imaginative, more fluid, uh, more fluid, fluid. more fluid. Flux. We need to be demi flux. <laughs> I, think, I think I think that that actually is you know that that's the issue, isn't it? It's that this binary has just been replaced with this other incredibly black and white understanding, and um, all of us who I mean. All of us who so also, I mean, I can't think of another um, sort of struggle, whether I think about civil rights or the struggle for gay rights, where one group of people asked another lot of people to give up certain rights. I mean, it was, uh, and, uh, and that's what's causing the conflict that cannot be named mm -hmm. still, you know, that's still difficult to talk about. So I really, um, I really appreciate this book, Kathleen, and I'm really glad you wrote it. And I think that this is time now that we should go off and have a drink. And I hope everybody's enjoyed it. And both me and Kathleen are happy to come and discuss properly and answer questions in real life yeah. in, in the next, whenever we can do that. But we can't do it now because there's just too many people here. And so please buy the book and uh, subscribe to my substack, suzannemore.substack.com for more of this sort of thing. I'm, and stuff. I'm subscribed to Suzanne's substack. <laughs> and really thank you everybody for being here. And we